We have one week left, thank you Jesus, in our series on hair. Because I'm scrambling, you guys, on uh, some of these subjects. It's, a, it's an unusual subject matter. But yet, at the same time, God will take some things that are ridiculous. The Bible says he'll, he'll confound the wise with the foolish things. So sometimes when we pick some of these subjects, I'm like, well, how is that going to work? So on week one, we talked about Samson. That was a natural because he got a haircut and there was some pretty devastating consequences. Last week, I only segued from a scripture referencing the, the revelation of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter one that really brought us to a place in Revelation chapter two, which was the letter to the church of Ephesus. And we really concentrated on verses four and five where Jesus says to the church in Ephesus, nevertheless, I've had this against you. You've left your first love. Remember, therefore, where you've fallen. Repent, do the first works, or else I'll come to you quickly, remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. And we talked last week that if anything or anyone ever supplants, removes, replaces Jesus Christ in our lives at the front of the line, and Jesus Christ becomes in the periphery, he's on the sidelines, he's in the back seat, he's on the back burner, he takes a secondary or whatever position after the first place position, we're out of order. And what Paul, uh, or what, what, what the Lord was telling uh, John as he was exiled on the island of Patmos, he said, listen, this is a church that's got a lot of good things going on. However, they've lost their first love. Any church or any believer that loses their first love attachment, their first love affection, their first love anchor to the Lord Jesus Christ has got to reorder some things, and this is what what Jesus was, he's like, they need to remember, they need to repent, or else I'm gonna come to them and I'm gonna remove their lampstand. He didn't say he was shutting the church down, but in essence, in really, in, in, in reality, he was, because he was saying they can still have church, they can still sing the songs, pastors can still preach his message, but if I remove the lampstand, which is really the light, the witness of being a light in the darkness, supernaturally and sovereignly, they can, they can check all those other boxes, but they gotta get back to making the main thing the main thing, and I'm always going to be the main thing. Can somebody say amen? amen. So this morning, I wanna deal with the subject. Last night I got up, had, hey, I'm 59, had to use the bathroom in the middle of the night, don't shout me down. I got back in bed, and it's not uncommon for me to, before I go back to sleep, to contemplate some things, to pray a little bit, not every time, but as the Lord leads, but last night at 424, when I got back into bed, I felt compelled to just to lay in bed and pray in the Spirit. And I really believe it's connected to what I wanna be talking about this morning, because I believe this is a subject that if you are not dealing with this, or, ha or, or if you haven't dealt with this, you know somebody who has, or potentially might be in the future. And today I wanna to talk about being anxious for nothing. And it says in Luke chapter 12, as I was thinking about this message on hair, and I felt the Lord specifically draw my attention to this, in one version of the Bible specifically, it says, what is the value of your soul to God? Could your worth be defined by any amount of money? God doesn't abandon or forget even the small sparrow he has made. He, how then can he forget or abandon you? What about the seemingly minor issues of your life? Do they matter to God? Of course they do. So you need never worry, for you're more valuable to God than anything else in this world. This is captured in the Passion Translation, which I'm using for my own private devotional times more often than not this year. The literal Greek reads it this way, not one sparrow is overlooked before God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are numbered, so stop fearing. And what Luke, the physician, who is one of the writers of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as he is writing this down, he is saying to one and all, to the people that were reading it then, in his contemporary times, and for us 2,000 years later, as disciples, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's saying, God is on the throne. He's paying attention, he's not asleep at the wheel, Nothing, uh, nothing evades his eye. He's ever watchful. He's ever mindful. 
He, he, he's not, you won't catch him napping. You won't catch him looking in a dire- other direction as things are going on in your life. Now, I, I said that very specifically, God is on the throne. I didn't say God is still on the throne because that would imply that God can be replaced or removed from his throne. And I say to you today, no, he cannot. God is over all things. He is our eternal father. He is our eternal creator. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, who is, who was, and who is to come. Can somebody say amen? He holds today, tomorrow, and eternity in his hand. That said, as it relates to the throne of God in our hearts, in our hearts on an individual level, you can replace and remove the Lord. That's exactly the point I was trying to make last week. When, when the letter was written to the church of Ephesus, saying, listen, God is no longer on the throne in the middle of your church. You're still serving him, you're still seeking him, but he doesn't have that first place position. So we gotta be mindful that on an individual basis, we, if we're not careful, we can construct and we can establish thrones within our heart that sometimes don't reflect what ought to be our first place position with our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. So you got to be very, very, very careful of that. But here's, here is Luke saying, listen, God is on it. God is watching. And in the Passion Translation, he wrote, it, it comes out, it's translated this way, so you never need to worry. And I want to talk this morning about worry, about distractions, about having a divided mind, a divided heart as a result of some of these things. A number of years ago, uh, I picked up a book. If, I didn't read it. Most of the time when I refer to books, I've read them. Renee bought this one and I just glanced at it because she was, she was busy and she was occupied reading it. But it was by Max Lucado, who's written more books in the last 30 or 40 years. He's just a prolific writer, just a wonderful man. The book that he wrote last year, was on, it was about the helper, the Holy Spirit, which is very surprising to me. Now, I grew up with a charismatic background. I'm ordained to Assemblies of God, and he does not drink necessarily from that well, but at 63 years of age, if you've read the book or you know his story, though he does not come from a full gospel background, denominationally speaking, in his prayer room one day, I mean, it's right in the first chapter of the book, he just was asking the Lord, he says, this is what the Bible says, and without, without a sermon, without, without anything, in, in his prayer time, he began to speak in tongues. And it, it just, that sucker punched me because that's the last person I would have expected. And, and he ended up writing a book last year on, on the Holy Spirit. But he wrote a book called Anxious for Nothing. And in the introduction of the book that I just glanced at, he, he, he notes that Amazon and Google and a few of these other major tech companies that provide biblical uh, 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 versions like like YouVersion or Bible Gateway or what have you. If you're reading a Bible on the Kindle, the consensus was this. The number one underscored scripture that they could tell from the people that were using their programs, their platforms, their apps was this. And it's found in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. This is number one. Now, if you were to ask me, that's probably not, I would have said John 3.16. I would have said Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I would, there's a whole litany uh, of potential power promises and power principles that are related to the word of God, I wouldn't have chosen that one. And yet that's the number. Why is that? Because we live in an anxiety ridden culture. And I'll share some statistics and some, some facts with you. The National Institute, Institute for Mental Health that, that evaluates mental disorders and different things that the anxiety disorder is now is at is at epidemic proportions. Over 50 million Americans feel the effects of panic attacks, phobias, and other anxiety disorders. 
for men in terms of, uh, for men, for the number one mental health issue, uh, I mean, for women, the number one mental health issue is related to anxiety, and for men, it's number two. Number one for men is actually addiction and drug abuse, but number two for men is anxiety. Number one for women is anxiety. The United States is now the most anxious nation in the world. And in his book, Anxious for Nothing, he provides this antidote that I found absolute, again, I didn't read the book, but I read enough. I found this antidote to be absolutely jaw-dropping, fascinating, puzzling, and kind of sad. And it detailed people that were trying to get to America legally, going through the immigration process. As a Canadian, I've gone through it. I did it. I checked all the boxes. I, I took my test. I wrote the papers. I pledged the oath, did the whole thing, and I am eternally grateful because I love this country, and I, I'm setting you up for an amen right here, but I say, God bless America. Amen. 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 But they noticed that with all these immigrants that were coming in, especially from countries that where the basic necessities of life were greatly under-resourced, diminished, if not available at all, that basically they were literally kind of trying to scrounge up whatever they could to make it through another day with their food supplies, with sheltered and roofs over their heads and clothes on their back and fresh water to drink. And they didn't have the basic necessities of life, but these countries, whereas in, whereas in America, we've got this anxiety epidemic, they only have one-fifth of the anxiety type of proportions or percentages in those countries. But something very strange happened once they landed in America, once they got on their feet financially, it wasn't that they got to America and they were living in a cardboard box in Ethiopia and now they're living in a cardboard box downtown LA. No, 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 no. They, they got here, they got established, they got a job, and they started making more. And if you've done any traveling, sometimes when you go to these countries, man, to see what people are existing on, we are so filthy rich in comparison to a lot of countries in the world. And even countries in Europe and some of the missions trips years ago, this is long before the war, 20 years ago when I've gone to Europe and I was preaching in the Ukraine and we were paying a guide that week, I think a hundred bucks and typically that's what he would make for an entire month. It's just kind of mind blowing. So they get to the United States, they get the assistance, they get on their feet, they start getting the job, they start getting a paycheck, they ma they're making more money than they've ever, ever made, and they're checking the boxes saying, I'm pursuing the American dream. But what they did not anticipate was how overcome they started to become with anxiety. And they didn't experience anxiety when they didn't have a roof, they didn't have a job, they didn't have a meal, they didn't have a table, they didn't have clothes, and yet they didn't have anxiety. They get here, they get all the things that they think are gonna make them happy, and now they're distracted, they're burdened, they're worried, why? They're worried, why? Because that's the culture that we live in now. And that's what's happening, and that's why the, 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 the people that are do the analytics and the algorithms and all of those things, and they're looking at who's reading this in, in their Bible version on Kindle, the number one thing that is underlined, be anxious for nothing, be anxious for nothing. I need that, I need that, I need that. And that's not somebody that's outside of the kingdom of God. That's somebody within the walls. And so I've done this long enough to know, this is, this is a great attendance here this morning, I love it. I'm not going to, I don't do it intentionally, just trying to set these guys up. But I'm not going to say that I'm displeased when I look over and I see the ushers trying to sneak some extra chairs out. That gives me a smile because I'm like, man, people are coming to our church. This is, this is a great thing. Well, why don't you set out more chairs? Because I really like to see them pull them out. No. <laughs> kind of sick, isn't it? No. <laughs> Be anxious for nothing. Max Lucado, uh, when he's writing, he, he talks about it in this book. I actually photocopied. I'm going to read it to you verbatim. But see if you identify with this on any level. And by the way, today you're getting the soft-spoken Todd. Because there are some, some subject matters 
There are some things where you just, you just go for it. But I felt, and I don't know if this is as a result of me praying in the Spirit at 424 a.m. today, but I, I know that there are people here today that you're already anxious. You walked in here anxious. You love the Lord. We're not making a, a claim or a judgment call on your love or your lack of love for the Lord. But I've known too many Christians. I've done too much counseling. I myself, as Pastor Todd, have, have had seasons where I've had extreme anxiety. And I've had two panic attacks in my life. And I thought I, I, thought I was having a heart attack. So I know. I know. So see if you identify with this. Here's what Max writes. It's a low-grade fear, an edginess, a dread. It's a wind that won't stop howling. It's not so much a storm as it is the certainty that one is coming, always coming. So you don't sleep well. You don't laugh often. You don't enjoy the sun. You don't whistle as you walk. I think it was Justin Bieber, and don't shut me out just because I mentioned that name. By the way, he was from Stafford, Ontario, and I pastored in Waterloo, and at one point we were looking to buy a house. It was about 45 minutes from where we pastored, and uh, depending on the day, we could have gone there, and little Justin Bieber would have been out on the courthouse, ding, ding, ding. Baby, baby, baby. But he wrote this. Now, you think about this. Now, this is a guy that is now worth about $300 million. By the way, moms and grandmoms, it's well worth it to, to videotape your kids singing happy birthday because that's how he got his start. He was singing on his birthday, and his mother had one of the old-fashioned video cams, sends off the, the deal. And Well, anyway. But here's what he said. It's hard to get out of the bed in the morning with the right attitude when you're overwhelmed with your life, your past, your job, your responsibilities, your emotions, your family, your finances, your relationships. When it feels like there's trouble after trouble, you start foreseeing the day through the lenses of dread. And you anticipate another bad day. So this issue of anxiety, it's very real. And until I had a panic attack, I'll confess this. When somebody I maybe was responsible for as a pastor and they would tell me about a panic attack, in my mind, I thought, well, how bad can it be? Come on. Just flip the script in your mind. And it's kind of like, it, it's like before I ever, I've thrown my back out two or three times. And what's odd or ironic is that when I've thrown my back out, I wasn't doing, I wasn't doing some CrossFit workout. I wasn't doing some Ironman uh, triathlete or triathlon or anything. One, I was at Fine Arts in Ohio, and I was having a muffin. And I threw my back out. <laughs> Another time, I was making the bed, and I was putting a pillow in place. Blew my back on both occasions, man. I was laid out for a couple of weeks. Prior to me throwing my back out, somebody would say, oh, man, I threw my back out last week. I couldn't move. And I thought, suck it up, buttercup. How, how bad can it be until you throw your back out? Same thing with panic attacks. Somebody would say, and I, I thought, well, they're, dead. they're probably weak-minded. They need to steal themselves. And I was driving here about six years ago from Chicago to Phoenix, 1,804 miles from my church parking lot to my condo that we had out here at the time. And I was crossing the New Mexico border into Arizona, and I was feeling so weird. And I, I, I called Renee repeatedly. I'm like, I, I don't feel right. I was driving all by myself. I said, I don't feel right. I, that something's off. Finally, I called her, and I was approaching Winslow, Arizona, Standing on a corner, Winslow, Arizona. And I said, honey, and she knows me well. I'm one, I hate hospitals. I'm not, I'm not the hospital guy. And I said, I don't think I'm going to make it. She's like, what are you talking about? I said, I, I can't explain it. I've never felt like this before. 
and I, I wasn't standing on the corner in Winslow, Arizona. I was in some urgent care, and they were doing all... And now they came back, and they said, your heart is healthy as a horse. You're as healthy as a horse. You're fit. Everything. And I'm like, I am? I, I think I'm having a heart attack. You're not having a heart attack. But in my mind, and man, I, I, was, I was tripped out. And I, I'm, I'm not given to that. So now when somebody says, I, I had a panic attack, my empathy and my compassion is on a completely different level. And I recognize it may not get to that extreme for, for, for some people. For some other people, yes. But what I know to be true is that anxiety is much more prevalent than many times that we're talking about. Mark 4, 18 and 19, it says, Now these are the ones that are sown among the thorns. They're, ones, they're the ones that hear the word of the Lord and the cares of the world. The cares in the Greek New Testament, it means to have your mind divided. And if you read in, in James chapter 1, it talks about being double-minded and you're unstable on all your ways. And I always like what Joyce Meyer says. If you're unstable, you're unable. If you're unstable, and what one of the things that make you unstable and unable is when you're double-minded, is when your mind is divided, and anxiety does that exact thing. In the Greek, it means distractions, anxieties. It means burdens and worries. It means to be anxious. Now, listen to me very carefully. It means to be anxious beforehand about daily life. So it's not like you're showing up today, and in the moment and in real time, all hell breaks loose, and you, your blood pressure starts to rise and your heart beats intensifies and you get anxious because you're experiencing the effects of, of what you're experiencing right then. Now this is what anxiety does, it begins to anticipate it, begins to assume that that is a foregone conclusion and before you ever get to that moment in real time, you're already anxious, you're already divided, you're already under the weight of that worry. That's why the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care... In other words, in your anxiety, your burden, your distraction, those things upon him, for he cares for you. Same verse in a different version. It says, pour out all your worries and your stress upon him. Leave them there for him. In Psalms 55, 22, it says, so here's what I've learned. So th through it all, leave all your cares and anxieties at the feet of the Lord, and measureless grace will be there to strengthen you. We got to bring these things, these cares, these concerns, these weights, these worries, these whatever, and we got to bring them to the feet of Jesus. And if we do, I mean, it's an unbelievable upside for us in terms of the exchange. We bring God all of our junk, all of our garbage, all of this stuff that has got us divided, and, and you know, and, and, that, and the Bible talks about it. a house divided against itself cannot stand. And we divide ourselves because we got God's promises over here, but we got our anxieties and our preoccupations, the distractions, the weights and the worries of whatever. And our mind is divided. And yet we bring all of that junk to God. And what does God give us? He gives us grace and he gives us what we need. And I, 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 I'm terrible at this. I should be better at this. So Tuesday, I'm, this is a real life example. Tuesday for the last six or seven months, I've been trying to get together with my retirement guy and uh, just making sure that my financial things and goals and objectives and measures or metrics are in place and everything else. And I think about that, especially yet at 59 and you start, you know, kind of counting backwards and kind of stuff. So I'll go in there and uh, it's, it's always been me that's been, something will pop up and I've been, a, I've had to cancel some of the appointments. So we locked it in. Last Tuesday, 10.30, I drive to his office. He's an awesome guy. Go in there, and he's got all of this analysis, okay? And I mean, you know, some of it's like hieroglyphics to me. It's like speaking in tongues with financial numbers. I'm like, huh? But he does all this stuff, and, and, and he, I'm, well, how, how am I doing? It's like you want your, your financial doctor to give you a checkup, say, listen, good. You're on spot. And I said, well, I, I, you know, I, based on this and the thing, you know, I've been working with you now for the last three years and how are we doing? And he's like, well, you, you, you're doing good. He's like, I, I have a, a, a scoring system. And any score, I can't remember if it was 80, 85 or 86. I, I think it was 80. He said, anybody above 86, they're hitting their stride. And our score was 91. 
Now, it's 91 out of 1,000. No, <laughs> it's 91 out of 100. And he's, he's like, you're right on track. But he said, I got to tell you, I got to tell you, uh, he's like, you're hitting it. You're at 91 in terms of checking the boxes. He said, so good for you, Todd. But he's like, you're, you're going to have to work longer. Why did somebody just laugh at that? that I've been dealing with this all week. He's like, you're going to have to work, you're gonna have to work longer uh, than maybe you an, an, an anticipated. I'm like, huh. What's that look like? And I'm not going to tell you. 91. I'm not going to work till I'm 91. Close. <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, okay, okay, okay. And I got out of there, though. But I, I'm, I'm being completely candid with you. I got out of there, and I'm grateful for good health. I'm grateful for solid financial stewardship and, and taking this seriously. And I haven't waited. And, and Renee knows it. And, we do, and, we, and we, we're very intentional about these things. I'm very intentional. And I think that comes out of my background when I bankrupted myself and business and everything else. So we're very careful about these things, very intentional about these things. But I got in the car, and I'm like, man, that is longer than I thought. Now, the good news is I love what I do. I would be doing this regardless. I, 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 don't, I'm, I'm, I don't preach because it's, what I, it's, it's who I am. I preach out of the abundance of my heart. I, I love the word of God. I want to honor God with my life. And I'm blessed enough to get paid to do it. So it, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty sweet deal. So I, I, there's no bitterness. There's no, but it did, it did cause me to reconfigure. Hmm. The bad news is, and Renee really enjoyed this, she's 10 years younger than me, and she's still going to be pretty young when I get to retire. She's like, nah, 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 nah. She'll still be real young. But I got in my car, and I started driving, and I started to get a little, well, what if uh, I'm strong, I'm healthy, but what if, and it's more than 10 years than, than the age I am right now. That's all I'll tell you. And I'm, okay, what, what if, 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 what if? And instead of bringing that to the feet of Jesus and just saying, God, I was given some news today that I didn't anticipate. It wasn't all bad. We're at 91, and we're, we got some attaboys and pats on the back for being good stewards in one regard. But this timeline is not what I was thinking about, and it's just kind of thrown me for a loop. But instead of bringing that and just putting that at the feet of Jesus... In the natural, I started to get all kind of distracted, preoccupied, and started to feel the weight of that. And I, it, ironically, I'm putting this message together, and Oswald Chambers said this, all worried is caused by calculating without God. Let me say that again. All worry is caused by calculating without God. And as Sam comes back to the keyboard this morning, that's what, I was, that's what I was doing. I was sitting in my car, driving away from, for the most part, a pretty positive meeting with my retirement planner. And yet, because of this extended timeline beyond what I was even thinking, because I had already thought, I'm going to work at least until I'm 70. But it's beyond, it's beyond that. And I'm like, oh, huh. And I was calculating without God. And I started looking at these things, and instead of just laying them at the feet and allowing God's grace, and ultimately, and it took, here's, you know, it was role reversal. Here, you know, I'm there, I'm the pastor, he's the financial planner. And the financial planner is, well, Todd, here's the deal. God's provided for you all along, hasn't he? I'm like, Yeah. Do you think he's going to continue to provide for you? Yeah. <laughs> Not much of a pastor, am I? Not much of a leader. And instead of just bringing it to the feet of Jesus, I allowed myself to momentarily get distracted. Then I allowed my, my anxiety to turn into anger when Renee started to mock me. No, I didn't. I want to just recite to you a lyric from a, a song that Clint Brown wrote years ago. The song is called At Your Feet. And I like Clint Brown. I love his songs. I love his music. 
Uh, I will share with you that one time he came out to do the Master's Commission Conference probably 20 years ago, and I thought, this is awesome. He, he brought his worship team with praise and worship. It's going to be off the charts. I had two or three of his CDs live from Orlando in his presence, in his presence too. Oh, shades of Brown. I mean, some of, the, some of my favorite worship songs, some of my favorite praise songs. Man, I love, I love the guy. So he sings that night, and he's just amazing. He's anointed. But then instead of sitting down, Pastor Lloyd says, and now Clint is not only going to be singing to us tonight, he's going to preach. And I'm thinking, well, he sings amazing, but I really hope he's a terrible preacher. <laughs> and nope, <laughs> turned out to be one of the best, best preachers I've ever heard in my life. And I'm like, that's not fair. <laughs> Such a great preacher. Such a great songwriter, such a great singer. He sits down at that baby grand piano. The guy made me sick. Amen. No, he didn't. He blessed me. But he writes this in this song, At Your Feet. And I'm not going to sing it. But listen to the words. It's hard to understand when life seems unfair. Lord, I'm carrying this load that I'm not meant to bear. But you said in your word that peace can be found. Now listen to this. If I can find the courage just to lay it all down at your feet. And it's an odd thing. In evaluating my own life, it's an odd thing sometimes the things that we cling to. That we know are no good for us. We ought to let go. It's like watching... One of the episodes of Hoarders are Buried Alive. The people, and, 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 I, and I'm not minimizing the mental health issues that are related around some of these individuals. But what they do many times, because they get so anxious about cleaning out their houses, they'll set up an area outside and they'll carry out boxes and boxes of trash, of things that are absolutely of no value whatsoever. And the person... The man or the woman will sit there in a, in, a, on a, in a lawn chair, at a chair, at a table, and they'll pass by these things that are absolutely obsolete, of no value. I mean, not, I mean trash. And they, they can't let go of it. They're like, no, keep, because they have to separate them in two piles. Get rid of, keep. And the things that people are saying, no, I can't let go. They're like, and, and many times it's the sons and daughters of these men and women. They're saying, mom. Dad, look, 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 and it's garbage. And yet they're like, keep, keep. And sometimes when it comes to anxiety, we don't follow through and really just putting it at the feet of Jesus. And I think that's why Clint Brown wrote that line, because it speaks to me. If I could just have the courage to lay it all down. Would you go ahead and stand with me at this time? I'm going to ask the prayer team if they will come up to the front. Had a number of people that said in the first service, I've got some anxiety issues. And maybe it's not every day. I had two panic attacks, and it hap they happened within a week of one another, and that was either five or six years ago. There were a, it was a very unsettling time in my life. Big changes were happening. And I didn't think that I was anxious about it. I, did, I, I, thought, I, was, I thought I was on solid ground. And then I got sucker punched. Ended up in the hospital. Then I ended up in Mayo. I got here. I, I made it from Winslow. I was in the, I was in the urgent care for five hours. They checked me. They cleared me. I drove the rest of the way to the Phoenix. The next day, I was fine. The day after that, within 48 hours, I was back in the hospital again. Not, no, I was tripping out. I don't know what the heck that was all about. But it rocked me. Flat out. It, it rocked. And it was, it was anxiety. Nothing more and nothing less. I don't know, I said in the first service, I don't know if I've ever been truly so completely free of anxiety that I could claim I've been anxious for nothing. I always seem to have a little something. But again, sometimes they're just minor things. I'll, I'll share with one with you right now. Last week, Renee told me 
It's not a big deal. But yet, I couldn't stop thinking about this. She's like, you know, Todd, that on the day of the wedding, my daughter's getting married to Jared on September the 2nd. So we do the setup. By the way, that week, so I'll preach on that Sunday. Then on Monday, I've been asked to do the college chapel. Then on that Wednesday, I'm back on deck for the Wednesday night. I don't have these message, messages written. Thursday night, we do the setup. Friday, we do the setup. Saturday uh, is the wedding. And by the way, I've been being coached uh, about how slowly I need to walk because I'm doing, I'm doing double duty. I'm the father of the bride, so I'm walking my daughter down the aisle. When I finish down there, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I'm going to have to say, who gives this daughter? And then I'm going to get back in line. I'm going to say, I do. And then I'm going to say, no, you may be seated. You may get... I'm doing both, okay? But then here's what got me stressed out. Okay, I'm just being as real with you as possible. She's like, Todd, I know you. And that when you, you know that you have a job to do, you like to get to it, but you can't do it. You're the father of the bride. But she said, you know that we have to have the prayer pavilion completely turned around and we have to have where we're having our reception at the main campus completely turned around before they have church on Sunday. So when the reception is done, we're responsible for the, that complete teardown. She said, I know you. She said, you've got to promise you won't do this. She's like, I know that you're going to want to get started. She said, it's our daughter. She said, I'm not, you're not allowed. Now I'm, I'm confessing this. I can't. I need to be focused on this wedding, but in my mind, I'm thinking, we got to get that done. We got to get that done because Phoenix, I have a responsibility, not just as a dad that day, but as one of the campus pastors, and you cannot allow that to happen, and they show up on Sunday morning, and the teardown's not done. And I'm thinking about that constantly. What am I going to do? 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 But I need to bring that to the feet of Jesus and just lay that down. By the way, this is this is the instruction this week. This, as I'm walking Ken, Kennedy down the aisle, this is how they showed me. This is this is this is the actual pace that I'm going to be walking my daughter. I thought they were kidding. No, like, like Todd, because I I walk quickly. You're like you can't walk normally. I'm like, well, well, how am I supposed to walk? It's not quite that slow, but that's how what it feels like to me. I'm like, come on, we're walking down an aisle here. Here's what I want to say. Here's our call to action this morning. If there's anything in your life that preoccupies your thinking, and maybe it's not even there right now, these things come up and you feel the weight, you start to worry. Those anxious thoughts start to come in. When the Bible talks about the peace that surpasses understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. It means basically God assigns like bouncers at the door of your heart and anxiety tries to approach. But my problem is I don't turn those, those preoccupations into prayers or into petitions. I start to feed them and fuel them so then the guards are not on duty. The sentinels are not showing up and they just kind of walk right into my heart and take over my heart doesn't have to be that way. Here's what I wrote down yesterday when I was putting the finishing touch on this. You need to cast your cares upon him because if you don't cast them away, you will become a castaway. And I looked up the definition of a castaway. It's a person who has been shipwrecked and stranded in an isolated place. And I thought, that's exactly what anxiety does. It can shipwreck a relationship. It can shipwreck your faith. It can shipwreck your family. And you find yourself shipwrecked and stranded in an isolated place. Max Lucado said, the presence of anxiety is unavailable, is, is unavoidable. But the prison, the prison of anxiety is optional. So there's always going to be circumstances that can provoke but the prison, I thought that's a powerful statement. Don't leave here this morning. And I'm really, I kind of preach this message for me to get me out of, out of some of the prisons and some of the bars. I'm looking behind. And it's a blessed thing. I get to marry my daughter. That sounds weird. It sounds like, it sounds like a show that's on the History Channel. I'm going to be performing 
If you want to make a sure bet, bet on this. Will Pastor Todd cry at his daughter's wedding? Yeah. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be spectacular. It's going to be sacred. It's going to be special. But I don't want my mind racing thinking about, okay, how are we going to get all these tables, all these tablecloths, all of these decorations, everything off the Phoenix campus, everything put away, everything that... I don't, I don't want to be thinking about that. I want to be thinking about this is my daughter, my pride, and my joy. And I am. But you hear my heart this morning. If you're here this morning, sometimes I ask you to bow your head. Sometimes I don't. I've been honest with you. I've put my hand up and said, this, this is an ongoing thing. And sometimes those tides are high and it feels like a tsunami. That's when I had the panic attacks. Other times it's just a low grade, but that's what Max Lucado said. It's just this howling of the wind. And it's not an actual storm, but you anticipate the storm's coming. And you start to look through life at life through the lenses of dread. If you're here this morning, you've already seen me raise my hand. I've already outed myself. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Todd, there are some things that are connected to anxiety, and that's between you and the Lord. If they're great and they're huge, if they're small and insignificant, but nevertheless, it's, it warrants some action here today. Say, I want to bring that. I want to get prayer, prayer for it this morning. Can I see your hands? Put your hands up. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. Look at all the hands. Everyone with your hands raised, would you get out of your seats? Come on. Just come on out of your seats. Everyone who raised your hand, Maybe if we can have a couple more people for the prayer team as well. Maybe some of our worship team. Look at all the people here today. And all you got to do today is just lay it at the feet. But we got to do this daily. I'm good at doing it in sermons and in, in moments like this, but we got to do it consistently. Form the holy habit casting all our cares upon him. Let's lift our hands all over this place. I want to pray a dismissal for everyone else. Heavenly Father, this morning, I do believe, Jesus, that it, uh, the Holy Spirit caused me just to lie in bed and pray in the Spirit for this exact moment, for these individuals here today. Uh, Lord, I didn't deliver it the way that I usually deliver it, but Lord, you're doing a new work in me. And there's something new that's happening there. And I just want to embrace all that you have and all that you are. I pray, oh God, specifically for this, this challenge of anxiety, the, the, this, this worrisome, bothersome thing, uh, things that start to divide our minds and they start to seep in. And the next thing I, we know, Lord, we don't have those guards over our hearts and over our minds. And it's like a runaway train. And I pray, oh God, uh, Lord, that those howling winds would cease and the winds of the Spirit of God would come in and gently nudge and fill and inspire and ultimately transform. Lord, so many of us, myself included, are on this journey. And God, we're just not gonna, we're not gonna just talk about it. We're gonna, we're going to follow through. We're going to bring those. Lord, I need to daily bring these things and just lay the worries and the distractions and the concerns at your feet. Give us the courage, like Clint Brown wrote about, just to lay them all down. We ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. God bless you. I'm going to be at that door to shake your hand. Stay and make sure that you get prayer for the things that you need.